because we're only just on two. Um, but I'll, I'll make a start because we have got quite a packed agenda. Um, so firstly, welcome everyone. It's, it's lovely that you can join us and I'm really excited about uh, this afternoon's session. Um, so I'm just going to do a bit for the housekeeping before we begin. Um, so firstly, there's a lot of people in the meetings. So it'd be great if you could all make sure you're muted so there aren't any funny background noises. We're also recording the event so we can put it on our YouTube channel. So the recording should only show the speaker. Um, but if you, you want to double make sure that you're not um, on screen, then uh, do feel free to turn your camera off. Please make liberal use of the chat boxes for comments, to share your experiences and also for questions, because we've got a question and answer session towards the end. Um, and if you want to pose a question, um, then it's great if you could put a, a capital Q at the beginning of it. That will make it easier for us when we're scanning the, the chat to pull those out. Um, so. I'm really, really excited about this event because, as, as some of you might know, um, I actually started life as an archivist and worked with archive collections for about 15 years before moving to work with MLA, Arts Council, National Archives and then Libraries Connected. So it, it's lovely this afternoon. I feel like the two kind of professional halves of my life are, are being brought together in one event. But because libraries and archives have always got very strong synergy, Archives are very often parts of, of larger library structures or closely aligned with them um, if they're part of local authorities. Um, and I, I think I'm always really excited to see what happens, the amazing things that happen when you bring together the collections and knowledge and interpretation at the, from the archive side, when you bring that together with library audiences. I think, you know, we've all seen some really brilliant work happen that way. So at Libraries Connected, we structured the universal offers to provide a clear framework for the impacts that libraries can make on people's lives. And it's been really interesting to work with the chief archivists in local government group over the last few months to explore how the universal offer framework can also be adapted by archives. So we'll hear a bit more about that this afternoon. So although today's session is, is quite short, we've only got an hour, I hope it will be really inspiring and thought provoking and I also hope it's just the start of a longer and deeper conversation about how we can develop closer working between libraries and archives. So hopefully lots and lots for us all to think about. Um, so I'm now going to invite um, the speakers for the first presentation. Um, so we're going to hear from Sarah Chubb who's the Archives and Local Studies Manager at Derbyshire County Council um, and also uh, manages the museum and Chris Ash, who's a senior library manager in Sandwell with archives, um, local studies uh, and also museums heritage. So uh, Sarah and Chris, over to you. Thanks Isabel. I'm just going to start sharing um, the presentation. Hopefully everybody can see that. Good. Um, right, well, as Isabella said, um, Chris and I um, are both working in the archive sector. Chris also works in the library sector as well. Um, and we're both on the executive committee of the um, Archive and, Lo and Records Association's Chief Archivists in Local Government Group, which is known as CALG, because otherwise it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and the genesis of this webinar really began pre-pandemic um, when CALG began to explore how libraries and archives might work together in the context of service delivery. So, um, yeah, there we go. Um, so, so to do this, we kind of decided to use the four Libraries Connected Universal offers to see whether and how archives could interlink with them. And that was something we kind of felt was really important because archives like libraries, they're kind of ideas banks, whether it's paper parchment or tablets, they're all the same in many respects because they're all vessels to impart knowledge to the reader. Archives can be seen as purely heritage resources, but like libraries, they're tools for positive, meaningful impact um, upon the lives of our residents. And um, our library resources and our archive collections can become vehicles to achieving that kind of goal. So we decided to undertake a mapping and gapping exercise against the universal offer framework. And we found that archive services essentially deliver against all the key elements within them. 
So most of you will probably be familiar with the four universal offers which are on this slide. And for, for the purposes of speed, because this is just a short presentation, I'm going to just briefly talk about the culture and creativity offer, um, because that's the universal offer that people would probably most naturally associate with archives anyway, and perhaps therefore needs the list less explanation. And then I'm going to hand over to Chris to talk about the other three. Um, so in terms of culture and creativity, archives obviously provide access to collections representing local and wider culture spanning hundreds of years. And those archives speak to the cultural identity of our local communities, and they can play a key role in supporting social cohesion, strengthening place and local identity, and so on. Um, archive surfaces often also hold material from other parts of the globe. Um, so collections tend to be quite international, um, which can be a bit of a surprise sometimes. And therefore, they can also bring world cultures to local audiences as well. There's always a real sense of excitement in discovering, handling and, and reading original documents. It, it just gives people of all ages the thrill of an immediate contact, the connection to the past. Um, and nothing really can replace that tactile physical experience of holding something that was written by a person hundreds of years ago. And so all of this kind of all works together to enable archives to complement the kind of published materials held in archives as well as um, contribute towards national event programs and local arts and literature festivals and all those things that are encompassed within culture and creativity. So that's that's the sort of straightforward one. And now I'm going to hand over to Chris to talk about the other universal offers in more detail as they relate to archives. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, so starting with the reading universal offer, archives provide a range of different things. They contribute to building literacy beyond printed media, such as exploring different styles and forms of writing. Archives and local studies material um, also build visual literacy using sources like maps, plans, photographs and drawings. They encourage empathy and imagination by connecting the reader with real people, places and events in the local area through regional documents. Archive services can also empower residents because they contain records that are really fundamental to the public's understanding of the world around them. Um, and this is because they can help people to learn how decisions were made that affect the society in, in which we live. So moving on to an example in relation to the reading offer, secondary school um, students read classical literature as part of the school curriculum, such as William Shakespeare. But these texts, as we know, require enhanced literacy skills and archivists are uniquely placed to support that. Um, there's lots and lots of digital online archival collections out there and many such as Shakespeare documented website, which is a kind of a collaboration, an international collaboration between Shakespeare Birth Trust and um, Folger, Folger Shakespeare Society in, in the US. Um, provide freely accessible 24-7 um, documents that purely relate to William Shakespeare. And it's all the original documents that enable um, people to see how famous sources like Shakespeare put pen to paper and archivists can then take this into the classroom and take um, uh, students through, through all these different aspects. Additionally, to complement that, archive services often hold original local documents created by ordinary people from the period. Um, these kind of really kind of complement the those, those kind of bigger bigger stuff. Um, they're really useful because they enable students to make comparisons with classic literature, but it's set within their local context. And in that in that situation, they can. Um, work with the documents physically, they can um, get that flavour of historical handwriting, how things were spelled phonetically, particularly back then, um, use of language and vocabulary. And overall, it then helps people to see the origins and the development of reading and writing, taking us right up to the present, the present day. 
So moving on to the information and digital universal offer, archives can provide access to unique local and historical information, which is increasingly online, such as family and local history resources and digitized collections. Similarly, they, as, as per the, the shapes, for example, they can help GCSE and A-level students with practical experience of working with primary and secondary source material, which is uh, intrinsic within the national curriculum. They can also give access to information such as adoption and medical records. And these are really important because they can help people to explore um, personal identity and consequently helps people to inform uh, life choices. Libraries also, and archives complement each other in another key way, which is they provide safe, neutral spaces, public access PCs, and also, as we, as we know now, is a national initiative around warm hubs, and it's a great way in which archives and libraries really complement each other on the service delivery there. So in terms of new technology, this is a growth area. Um, smartphone compatible history trails and interactive community engagement platforms are starting to really bring library and archive collections to parks, to streets, to local landmarks. And these digital apps often include virtual reality and augmented reality. And what that enables things to do is you can blend the past with the present. So there are, are some great examples out there online of, of merging those historic images with current images. And it really gives a unique perspective on how towns, cities and rural landscapes have developed. Uh, lots of examples out there. Tamworth Borough Council have produced an augmented reality history trail, which takes visitors on a tour around the town using interactive mapping storytelling photographs and other art forms to provide an engaging experience. And finally, moving on to the health and wellbeing universal offer. Um, this is another exit, an area where archives can really contribute to, to, to this part of service delivery. So they provide access to records for both individuals and communities, such as health and social care records. They hold collections that reflect all of society, including underrepresented groups, which is really important. It, it, it's a great resource and it's good for promoting empathy and understanding. Like libraries, they um, can help people to make new friends, reduce social isolation, and they're brilliant tools for facilitating emotional resonance. They can also be used to support projects which are closely aligned to the five ways to well-being and may also be aimed at improving the well-being of people with mental health conditions. So, for example, um, Norfolk Record Office have an ongoing project called Change Minds. This particular project provides an architectural adventure, really, for local residents who live with mental health conditions and are on low incomes and it also incorporates carers, volunteers and staff and it involves research in two digitised 19th century Norfolk County Asylum case books at Norfolk Record Office and at, North, North, uh, and at Norwich Millennium Central Library. They engage people in this project in the exploration of the local heritage mental health and identity. As part of that, there's a strong kind of participatory approach. So um, participants get to do artwork, music, or history, creative writing, such as poetry and prose. And these are then combined with the archival documents from the past and the 3D reconstructions that Norfolk have produced of Norfolk's County Asylum to provide a really holistic, immersive experience. And I think, I think the Change Minds project is just a really shining example of many across the country of how the cultural sector and health services can come together to achieve some amazing things. And it, it, by doing that, um, it really great, greatly 
um, extends the reach and impact and demonstrates that value added power of collaborative working to meet societal objectives. So we're now going to move on to the case study section of the webinar. And our next two speakers are going to share some more detailed examples of what can be achieved through joint working and to stimulate ideas and discussions for more work in this area. But we also wanted to sum up by posing a few final questions to reflect on, which um, myself and Sarah have touched on during the presentation so far. Firstly, how can libraries and archives create more added value um, through collaborative working for our customers and for the stakeholders. Secondly, how, in, in, in what other ways can we collectively work on addressing broader societal goals and local government objectives? And, and thirdly, can we improve the impact of our advocacy, both locally and nationally? So we're very keen to hear your feedback. So pop your thoughts in the chat and ask questions in the question and answer. And we're going to be circulating a survey for, form following the webinar. And finally, there are a few web links um, just popped on the slide there, um, which we can circulate um, following this. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Joe Terry, who also sits on the Chief Archivist in Local Government Executive Committee, and she is the Interim Head of Archives Heritage and Lib Libraries and Arts at Staffordshire at Borough Council. So Joe's going to talk about the Staffordshire History Fe Festival. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Joe. Well, hi everyone. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. So just give me a moment. Someone tell me if that's come through. Yeah, I can see a nod. Right. Okay, so I'll reintroduce myself. It's, it's a very long job title. Um, so I'm Jo Terry. Um, my substantive post is that I'm, I'm Head of Archives and Heritage, but at the moment on an interim basis, I'm also the strategic lead for Libraries and Arts for Staffordshire County Council. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is the really long partnership that we have between Staffordshire Archives and Heritage and Libraries and Arts teams. Um, and I'm, I am going to talk about the Staffordshire History Festival, but also some of the joint projects and events that we've been doing for really almost getting on for 20 years. So just a little bit about who, who we are. So the Archives and, and Heritage Service, which sort of came to they came together as two as one service in 2011. Um, they preserve and connect people and communities to outstanding designated archives, museum and William Salt Library collections across Staffordshire, Stoke-on-Trent and beyond, whilst also ensuring statutory access to our corporate records and supporting transparent governance. We're currently working on the Staffordshire History Centre project for which we've received a 3.9 million National Lottery Heritage Fund grant. And this project will enable communities to access over a thousand years of history and support the recovery of Stafford Town Centre after the COVID-19 pandemic. And just a sort of fact for you is that in the last year, we've engaged over two million people with our collections online. So connecting people and places within Staffordshire to feel rooted within their community. Libraries and Arts Service manage Staffordshire's statutory library offer. We deliver programmes of activity which promote literacy, learning, prosperity and well-being within our communities and that's across 16 county managed libraries, 27 community managed libraries, two mobile libraries and seven prison libraries. And similarly our top fact is in the last year we've engaged over 4.7 million people through our library social media during connecting um, communities. So as I said prior to 2011 we were actually three separate services, we were libraries, archives and then heritage and arts but we we've sort of the heritage and arts service was split between the two and since about 2008 we've been in the same division so we've been aligned within our, our directorate we actually formed a local study steering group right back in 2002 and we carried out an audit of collections and since then really we've worked together to develop joint programs of activity which really culminated in the staffordshire history festival 
So what I'm going to do is cover that long joint re um, working relationship, um, particularly around local studies. And I'm going to start with the local studies steering group. So back then in 2002, the head of archives, which was, wasn't me, I hasn't had it, it's my predecessor, convened that first meeting of the local studies steering group. And really the intention was to develop and implement a policy and strategy for local studies material. And it was attended by key officers from archives, libraries and the museum. And it was held at the William Salt Library. And the William Salt Library is a quite an unusual library in Staffordshire. It's actually in Stafford and it holds the collection of William Salt, who was a collector, 19th century antiquarian and collector. But it's also continued to collect um, books um, and manuscripts to the present day. In effect, it is the local, county local studies collection with these additional rare books and manuscripts. So the group looked at the challenges initially of the first census being released online. They talked about the news plan project. Any of you that have been around long enough will remember that this was a project to microfilm, which is the technology we had then, local newspapers. And they also wanted to develop a joint approach on local studies. And what we identified was that local studies was that one key type of material which crossed the boundaries of all, all three services. So an audit of material held in libraries was instigated and a collecting policy was agreed to avoid duplication and ensure items were received into the correct repository. We also began an extensive programme of training and familiarisation which became known as Beyond the Library and it was developed for staff across the services. And with funding from uh, MLA West Midlands we developed a local studies toolkit for staff from the three services. This was added to uh, an, a website, an internal website and shared across the service areas and that was to give staff more confidence when dealing with local studies and also for library staff to signpost to archive and heritage services as appropriate. Since 2015 we've also worked as a group um, together on local study stock which has been reviewed wherever we've developed a new library in Staffordshire so for example in, in 2015 we relocated Stafford Library uh, and my team my archive and heritage team worked with the library team to ensure that we um, collected certain material for the William Salt Library but also to advise we did the same process for the Litchfield Library in 2018 if anybody hasn't visited Litchfield Library please do it is fabulous and again, some of those items we transferred to the William Salt Library or the archive service. And we also worked with library staff to advise on what items should be kept locally. So at Litchfield, the archive service also has a local history and access point, which is supported by volunteers, which our library staff manage. So the local studies steering group also focused on coordinating events around local history. Uh, and gain funding for joint marketing and promotion. So back in the 20, sort of the 2000s and 2010s, this was mainly actual printed leaflets and posters. And eventually these events came together as local history months taking place in September. And so the, how this would work is that the Archive and Heritage Service would sort of contribute talks or exhibitions, but these would take place in, in libraries across the county. It was really popular and eventually this was expanded. We've also collaborated on quite a number of projects and I'm really only just picking out three. There are many projects I could have used. Um, the first one was that uh, early in, um, in the planning, we, we considered the Staffordshire Great War Centennial Project and we were fortunate to receive Arts Council England funding of 80,000 in 2012. And that meant that Archives and Heritage, Libraries and Arts and also our Historic Environment team could um, work together and it funded audience research and the creation of a Great War website for Staffordshire. That research then went on to be used to support further externally funded applications for projects to, um, to deliver across the county. And that included the Staffordshire Repeals project, which the archive service led, focused on the military tribunal records that we hold. The library service worked on the Tolkien trial. That Tolkien trial still runs today about J.R. Tolkien's presence in Staffordshire in the Great War. And then also the library led and archive supported Kitchen Goes to War. So the Kitchen Goes to War exhibition came out of research carried out from our Staffordshire Appeals project and it explored how families on the home front did their bit for the war effort and using everyday domestic objects from our museum collections and, and um, archives from our collections, children across Staffordshire experienced and learnt about what life was like in a hands-on way. The exhibition toured primary schools and libraries across Staffordshire and then interactive workshops were led by a costumed actor with interactive sessions for children and families who had the opportunity to meet a character from 1918 
ask questions and learn more about the impact of the First World War on the lives of women and children at home. And that project had a 10,000 grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund and we had nearly 21,000 people attending community events and 12,000 pupils attending from local schools. More recently, we worked together on the, <clears throat> the Lockdown Memories project, which launched in the summer 2020. And the aim was to collect memories and experiences and items related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And working with the library service, the Archives and Heritage Service received over 120 responses to an online call out. And really, we harnessed the power and reach of the library's social media because they, they've got a wider reach than the Archives Service working collectively, we were able to gather um, stories and experiences and personal thoughts on how COVID-19 had affected people and what it was like to live down those periods of national lockdown. So as part of the project, um, funding was also sought from West Midlands Museum Development Programme. And this funded a series of online workshops. And we worked with the Staffordshire Poet Laureate. And as, as you can imagine, the library service um, is, is the service that organises the appointment of the Staffordshire Poet Laureate. And at that time, it was Mel Ward or Woodend, and we worked with a visual artist, Yunuk Saka, to support our audiences to share experiences of COVID-19. So they did that using sort of creativity and a visual sort of output. And that enabled us to connect, collect, capture those responses for our collections. So then in 2016, um, the two services, uh, again, sort of under the auspices of the Local Study Steering Group, we agreed that we would actually extend Local Community History Month into two months, covering September and October. And this was because basically there was just so many events and so much we could do, we needed more, more than one month. And we also wanted to ensure we extended it to cover Black History Month, which is in October. So it was renamed the Staffordshire History Festival. There was new branding developed to promote the festival across the county. And it's really, um, it's led by the Art, Library and Arts Service and they engage more partners to deliver a really full programme of events. So in the first year in 2016, we engaged 26 partners and we delivered 113 events across all areas of the county, which resulted in over 36,000 participants. This time the festival really shifted into using digital marketing through social media to promote it rather than funding printed booklets. So the types of events range from talks, walks, displays, arts and crafts, reenactors, exhibitions, and they cover a really wide age range. Some libraries link them into local events. For example, in Purton Library, the History Day was on the same day as the Purton Show. So in 2021, we were still um, working in the sort of the COVID pandemic, and so the situation was a little bit unclear. So what we did was made a plan for a virtual festival as we had done in 2021, but we were flexible and uh, wanted to explore opportunities for physical activity events or exhibitions if, if that permitted. So the two services worked closely together to consider what key activity could be created to go online and what projects we were already doing that could support the festival. And as, as I said, we planned tentatively for physical engagement as well. We all agreed across the two teams to highlight the hashtag Staffs His Fest so that all our social media posts could really draw the festival together. And that hashtag was shared with our comms team and other partners as well, so that everyone could promote the same theme. We also collaborated, collaborated on joint um, press release uh, and we publicised it in our e-newsletters. So the library's digital team and the archives and heritage team developed a programme of content for two months of the festival, drawing on local themes such as Staffordshire legends, historical places, royal visits and local history knowledge. We also wanted to support the key sort of universal library office that we, we featured in that month. So we looked at Black History Month, Libraries Week, National Poetry Day and Get Online Week, all of which fell during the Staffordshire History Festival. In addition, we promoted um, Bookstock, um, both physical and virtual, and also the Ancestry Library offer and, and also archives and heritage resources such as the Staffordshire Name Index and the Meaningful Mementos website. So as you can see, we carried out 47 activities and we get engaged with 27 partners. And anecdotally, a lot of people expressed how good it was to be back in the library and record office at a physical event. So we collaborated really closely uh, and delivered a, a really excellent festival. And I'm just going to close on. Yeah, so we're now actually in the middle of the 2022 festival. Uh, and again, the emphasis actually is on much more of in-person visits and return to our services. And we've got events such as a weekly online local history quiz, um, the archive service asylums, pop-up exhibition is touring libraries, 
Purton History Day is happening on the 8th of October and we've got tours of the William Salt Library happening on the 10th of October. And for the future, we'll continue working together to deliver the Staffordshire History Centre project with many activities and exhibitions being delivered through our local libraries. And we'll continue to identify joint projects that we can work on together. A long and mutually beneficial relationship, I do think shows how archives and libraries and heritage and arts can work really effectively with the, the universal offers, especially culture and creativity. And I think collectively we can have a wider impact on our communities and residents. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Joe. That was brilliant. And I, I just, I was really, really struck by what you said about um, the, the local studies crosses the boundaries between archives, libraries, heritage and arts and is a really connecting force between all three services. Also, I think I was really excited by all the sort of physical nature of the activities that you're you're delivering through your through those those services and those through local studies and and um, and and I thought yeah just just making the point that local studies isn't just about the past but about the very present through that that amazing lockdown reflections that you were you were describing so thanks so much for that and I think that kind of cross sector cross organisation partnership is a real reflection on the, the next speaker as well. So um, I started working with Kat ooh, probably a year ago, maybe more than that ago, Kat, when Kat um, was is a Kat is a creative director, cultural strategist, um, a producer and festival director with lots of experience of developing cultural programmes. And she came to Library Connected and said, oh, I've got to do this work on the women's Euros. Could libraries be involved and how could we be involved? And, and so as we started working with Kat, we, you know, we were amazed at the, the history and the rich history behind the Women's Euros that was being uncovered by the work that Kat was doing. And, and just it really excited us about the potential for this kind of work. So we thought we'd ask Kat to come and just talk about the work she did for the Women's Euros and, and is continuing to do um, as we speak um, and, and share with you the, and just to think about what the future and potential of that kind of joint working could be. So over to you, Kat. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you all and uh, let's get this going and then yeah, perfect. that's working. Is that working, Sarah? You can give me a nod. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this, um, this programme of activity, which, as Sarah said, we'd started talking last year, which was actually too late to start talking. It was, it was a really rushed programme. It was a huge project and, and we rushed it all through and, um, oh yeah, still recovering slightly. But it came from um, a demand by our host cities. We work with nine host cities and they really saw an opportunity in the Women's Euros to amplify the tournament, to cross fertilise audiences between arts and sports. I think there was some kind of sense it could be, it could have the same impact that London 2012 had in terms of cross fertilising audiences. You know, one of our cities said, you know, well, if it wasn't for the cultural programme, it would have just been another match in the London Stadium. So there was a real drive from our local authorities to take part. And it was the first time the FA had ever done a cultural programme. So um, that threw up some challenges, obviously, because it was a really different world for them and equally in reverse, because it was a very different world for all of us cultural leads. So it was a really interesting and rich experience, but a few challenges along the way, not least, you know, we just got our funding and the Omicron lockdown happened. So it was all um, under special circumstances. Um, we got quite a lot of money thanks to Heritage Fund and Arts Council so it was a three million pound programme lots of match funding from our host city so it was really large scale and the reason I wanted to work on it and the bit that kind of came through quite strongly was this hidden history of women's football which is really closely aligned to the social development of women's rights and, and liberties so that was a really major thrust and that was pushing all of us but then before we did the actual um, commissioning and programme shaping I also ran a consultation with our fans. So we worked with the Football Supporters Association and we worked with 64 million artists who work with young people. And everything we did was informed by fans. And fantastically, one of them said, oh, we can never get enough history. Uh, and that was good enough for me because I really like history. <laughs> so that really became a, a real bolster to everything we did. Um, so yeah, as I said, it was a real chance to capture this story. It's it's a really hidden story and lots of people generally think women's football's 20 years old, um, but actually we've got recorded matches way back in the 1890s. 
a really strong link to the suffragettes, this picture is Nettie Honeyball, which probably isn't her real name. Um, but she, she founded football teams in the 1890s and took them touring. And it was a really important link to the rational dress code, which is why women's footballers have always worn boots and shorts and, and not the long dresses because of this really close link to the suffragettes and the women, uh, rational dress movement. Um, but it was a real opportunity for people who weren't necessarily interested in football. I'm not generally a football fan, but I'm interested in women's history. So there was a real opportunity for this programme to talk to wider audiences and to make links to other stories, women's stories throughout the project. And that became really important. Um, the 70s and 80s are a really rich source of information for us and talk about working with archives, but actually the archives were bare, museum collections were bare, these stories hadn't generally been collected. And that became a really major uh, moment for us because we really realised that actually if we wanted to do this project right, it had to be out contemporary collecting and it had to be about the future. And we did have support of some really big organisations behind us and also some really small organisations. So, you know, we worked with museums as big as the National Football Museum through to at the local archive centre in Lee, which used to be the Lee Town Hall. So a real difference in scale across the whole programme. Um, the main thrust of our heritage exhibition was um, an outdoor programme. So here you'll see some of these structures. And these were hosted in every city apart from Brighton and Manchester. And they told the story of women's football from 1890 through to the present day. We had a structure which told uh, the story of the way for Euros, and then the host cities themselves created two local um, structures. There's the three panels, it's quite hard to tell from the photo, but that quite often went into delving into their archives to find pictures if they could, or um, finding local women to come and tell their stories and capturing them. And it was a real mix across the country. So Sheffield actually had quite a lot of photos of women engaged in football, but they were the only one. Um, Southampton found two, but a small article in their newspaper suddenly brought a lot more information forward, which was quite nice. A, a, a couple of sisters who weren't necessarily the young themselves had found photos of their mother playing in the 1920s. And stuff. So some really nice collections came forward because of this project. But the outdoor exhibition reached hundreds of thousands of people and in our resident survey it scored really highly. And you'll see on the, the pictures on this, there's a real boost to us. So a lot of these came from the National Football Museum, but lots of them came from the Getty Images. And my goodness, searching through their archives is um, it's time consuming. Because if you type in women and women's football, you, you don't get very much. So you have to do <laughs> lots of digging around to be um, to really be sure to get the pictures you wanted. But we ended up with a really fantastic collection of photographs, and a lot of which hadn't really been out in the public too much. Um, and then the local stories also is a real opportunity to encourage people to keep coming forward with collections because we really wanted this to be the start of a project and not the end of it. Um, we also ran indoor exhibitions so as I say some of these are in big museums such as Football Museum or Brighton Museum. Football Museum still going by the way so you can still go and see that. Rotherham's still going, Southampton's still going so lots of these projects are still running and um, yeah, eight museum and archive exhibitions of varying size and scale, but amazing amount of stuff came forward. Southampton has this huge number of women footballers and we've got England caps, blazers, programmes, photographs, bags, all kinds of stuff. And Brighton did a really lovely project. They did a dream team of 23 players through history and found some extraordinary objects. So. Um, Petra Landers from Germany, she lent to the collection a tea set. She won the Women's Euros in 1989, and the women were presented with a tea set each as their prize. So really the, the collection was really indicative of not just women's football, but where women are in those times. So there's some really lovely stuff in those exhibitions. And we worked a lot with the old footballers. We are so much in that I was getting emotional talking about them. They were such a lovely bunch of ladies to work with. Um, so here we have Jan at the front. Um, she played for the Manchester Corinthians and then Gail behind who played for Man City. They were so generous with their time, these ladies, and there was a real sense. Um, no one had ever asked their stories before. So a real strong sense from them that they hadn't been valued and 
the FA wasn't interested and the public weren't interested. And very much for the women who played in the 60s and 70s, they were pariahs of their time. You know, they they didn't confess to being footballers. So some really moving and emotional stories came forward. And we've 36 of those films of these ladies are on the FA website. So really extraordinary stuff. Lots of stuff going into the local archives. If they didn't want to donate objects, we photographed them and we captured them digitally. And lots of oral history is collected. Lots of um, our local authorities have actually made digital and online exhibitions. So Trafford made a huge online project. So you can see that. But this is them looking at the 1921 ban. Of course, what that did for them. But if you want to hear football stories, then uh, that's another, that's a whole other webinar. Um, so this is the Manchester Corinthians in their heyday in 1970, where they won the Reims trophy. And uh, the Manchester Corinthians were great. They took part in so many of our activities. So we had a whole range of school holiday programmes. So many of those happened in libraries. And with the new archive material we found, or old things that people had found, lots of talks, lots of knit and natter groups in libraries got involved. So there's lots of design your own football kits, design your own scarves. And we made an education resource, which was about how do you make a collection? And people use that in lots of different settings. And we did a photography campaign in order to collect new archive material, because what we realised was the fans were missing, you know, the fans said they never see themselves. So we did a, ran a huge photography campaign to collect pictures of fans. And we've been doing training online to make sure people can archive and, and really look after their own collections if they weren't part of our project. Creative Commissions, and we work with the UK Web Archive, who have been digitally archiving all our digital outputs, really. We also use the heritage for our creative project. All the work we did in the arts programme was inspired by the heritage. And, and that kind of very directly, the libraries programme, which I'll talk about, or kind of indirectly. So, um, for instance, the super compensation cycle really picked up on the fact that these women had been invisible for years and made a big project about making women visible. Um, Idle Women was really looking at how women didn't have the space to play, how they weren't allowed access to land and, and how we changed that going forward. And they're, they're going to build a stadium for the future. It's a long term project where they're going to design and build a project all by women, all left by women. And the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra ran com um, community workshops to compose anthems for every house city. But so much of that drew on the heritage. People were really inspired by it. And very often they took in our like, photographs. So, or actually, we ran quite a lot of those um, workshops in libraries. So the libraries for those days were quite noisy with trumpets and string and flutes and things. So a really, really kind of cross section of people were involved in leading those projects. I've just got one slide from the heritage resource, but you can see from this how it encourages people to look in archive collections or just even kind of magazines. And we made quite a lot of displays within libraries based on this project. Um, this project is going to be remade. So it's um, we've got the women's anniversary coming up. November the 18th is the anniversary of the England women's team. And they played their first match in November 1972. And we are re making that library resource so it's really focused on England women but it it is anyway and in that it encourages you to look in your archive who are, who are your local women and who are the women that inspire you so you don't have to make it all football based you can make it about a group of suffragettes or a group of uh, women's rights leaders or whoever you want really so that is coming out again in November um one of the things we did for the first time was research all the women who ever played for England because the FA never kept a record. So that's a little bit of nugget for the archivists out there. They, they never they, they never kept a list of who played. So that's taken us quite a long time. But we now have a list of all the women who played for England. This is the 1972 team. And um, tomorrow night, they'll be getting their FA caps for the first time. And we'll be parading around another 100 women who played for England in those passport tickets as part of the England-USA match. I put the web links there to our heritage archive. That is also going to change and that will become, um, it will move to the englandfootball.com. And uh, then the library's resource is still available to use in its Euros form, but that will also move to the englandfootball.com for November.
So that's kind of a whistle stop for a huge program. And uh, very happy to say more if there's questions. Wow, thank you. That's so inspiring and bringing all those um, voices to the fore and unearthing all, all those forgotten histories. Um, yeah, really amazing. And what an amazing um, year to do it in as well. There must have been so much excitement around this. And the project obviously led to the um, victory of the, the England women's team, which is, which is great. But those have all been really, really great, um, great questions, great um, presentations. So there's quite a lot of questions here in the um, in the chat box that I've been trying to compile. Um, so, uh, so I'm actually going to go from the from the bottom. And there was a, a question from Melinda Haunton, which she addressed to Joe. But I think all, all of all of the speakers could help answer this. Um, it's clear. Melinda says it's clear how vital collaboration has been in enabling libraries, arts, and heritage to achieve more. So do you have any lessons learned on how to make that happen smoothly? Are there any areas of mutual misunderstanding you had to unpick or key elements that really help bring everyone together? So maybe, Joe, have you got any lessons learned and then we can move on to Chris, Sarah and Kat. Isabel, Joe's just said she's lost sound and she's going to leave me going <laughs> again. So just at the perfect time. So maybe the others can start and hopefully Joe will join us again. So, so Chris or Sarah, would you like to come in on that one? I think the kind of key to it really is, is communication and getting every, getting everybody around the table and um, uh, talking about the opportunities because I think as kind of Isabel said at the start this is part of a bigger conversation and there's kind of two elements to this really there's the, the bottom up and the top down so we've been looking at stuff you can collaboratively work on on a local level and talk with the relevant parts of your local government areas but also at the, the, the different levels, the national level, we can have these kind of conversations um, and start to sit around the table and, and move forward in, in what is quite clearly now becoming a multitude of different ways we can go with this. Sarah, have you got yeah. um, things to add on that? I suppose that's an essay sort of from a kind of personal perspective um, that I think that the main thing is that we sometimes just don't talk to each other enough um, and um, we are all guilty and I say that um, I'm, it's within Derbyshire for instance we're all guilty of going off down our little projects and not having those com regular frequent conversations to just see how they could be we could be working together more and I think that's definitely something we're trying to improve on in uh, uh, where I work um, but I, I think that's probably, I, I don't think there generally are misunderstandings or anything like that, because I think we're all kind of on the same page. It's just that we're so used to not always working together or only doing it for a special project um, that we can be guilty of forgetting to do it. So, so yeah, really, I, I would just say um, um, thinking about it every time and talking to people is probably the key and then things would naturally flow from there. Great. Um, Joe. I don't know if you heard the question from Melinda. It was about lessons learned about how you can make collaboration between libraries, arts and heritage. How can you make it run more smoothly? Are there any areas of misunderstanding you had to unpick or key elements that help bring everyone together? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think obviously my presentation focused. The key thing that brought everyone together was the local studies collections and the, the, what the library staff wanted was our advice and guidance particularly around copyright that you would think it but copyright was a uniting thing <laughs> in that we we all collectively worked that one out together so that you know library staff have got um uh, felt they've got a policy they could refer to and could be quite confident about photos particularly they had in their collection i think you know unpack the sort of things that we had to sort of understand about each other there was <laughs> there's obviously a very large difference between the size of the two services so the library services is much bigger than mm. the the archive and heritage service so it's recognizing that the what's the archive team you know got the expertise that didn't have the capacity and that's why we brought in the training program because we couldn't just answer everything for for library staff um but that was actually also really beneficial and that they they the staff that did you know came on that program 
really enjoyed that. You know, they discovered more, and then they, you know, they felt more confident signposting. But I think that's a different the difference in size and recognizing one team doesn't have the same capacity as the other. Um, and equally, as an archive and heritage team, we we can't possibly do all what the library service does. So to, you know, you learn to play to each other's strengths. Thank you. And Kat, you've got really interesting experience of bringing together really, really diverse partners around heritage and archive themes. So what's your advice? You know, so I've worked with archives a lot through, um, I also worked with Parliament and also in Southampton. We recently worked on the Mayflower 400 project. Um, I really echo Joe's kind of comments. I mean, the copyright was a real surprise <laughs> and a lesson for when we made that outdoor exhibition. Um, so yeah, so really make sure you still have a good understanding of that. Um, and then for me, it's the, and I suppose it's Joe saying it's about capacity, but it's timelines, you know, because actually if you're working with three different teams, they are all working on different time scales. And some of that is capacity, but some of it is they have um, planning. They've been planning for years to do a certain thing. And then their arts colleagues come in and ask them to do something else. And it, it can be a bit of a shock or a surprise. So I think, um, it's, we never ne will ever have the luxury of the time we need, but I think that's that kind of really understanding that it can sometimes take a lot longer when you're mm. working with themes because everyone's working at, at different paces due to capacity or on different projects to start with. And I think really it's just that um, it's having that real clarity of what you want from an archive, I think, is really important for the archivist because I think sometimes we go in creatively and just think everything's wonderful. and and give quite quite sloppy briefs to the archive team about what we're after but actually when you you get it right you end up with some really fabulously rich content so i think that's really important as well great brilliant thank you um i just want to point out as well some things that have been dropped into the chat some resources that are well worth looking at so the silip local studies group has produced a really useful toolkit and that's going to be launched at TNA on the 21st of October. So there's a link there in the chat, but we can also circulate the link to everyone after the event. And um, something equally fabulous that I've just had a look at, National Archives has a digital engagement toolkit. So it, can, it looks at different types of platforms such as Google Maps and My Maps, and, and also thinks about the different kind of audiences and the different kinds of projects. So you can really fit that together, find the right platform for your project and your audience. So again, really worth looking at. But to follow on from that, there were actually a few questions there about um, about some of the, the more um, use of technology. So a couple of questions about um, are there any really good apps or VR that compare historic photos of places then and now? Um, and, and does anyone know any examples of um, our, uh, local uh, council, local history or archive services using um, augmented reality or interactive maps. So I don't know if anyone's got any answers to those technology questions. I don't know about the tech, but a fantastic example I've seen at the moment, which is touring. So it might become is the story trails, which is part of the unbox. And they're really, I mean, they've, they've had a huge budget, but sure. you can see it, it's beautiful. Some of the work they've created and some really clever um, VR and AR. So that, that's worth Kind of following up and investigating on that it's something new yeah and that, that was intended to be quite groundbreaking um and new sort of cutting edge technology um, but at the heart of it what's lovely about that at the heart of it is um local people's stories and voices so it's a very sort of grounded almost quite traditional um local heritage project but using this technology and hopefully some of that technology will you know become cheaper and easier for us all to use but i don't know if um Joe, oh, Joe, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I used to be involved uh, on the Victoria County History um, National sort of steering group. So there's Layers of London is a really excellent um, website that I would look at. That's, that is a really good one. And then there, there, there is a VCH app as well. So you can, um, Victoria County History apps, that's the sort of definitive local history created, not for every county, but for quite a few. And you can use that when you're walking about and you can, um, and that does bring up, you, so you could be stood, say, in, I don't know, Stafford Market Square, and then bring up that app and it will show you um, local history photos that relate to that. But Layers of London is like, I mean, that had extensive external funding, but it is a fabulous example. 
Right. And there's some more um, examples. Heather Forbes has said, uh, Know Your Place, that's a great website for southwest of England, lays some maps that you can roll back and see what the area used to look like, and you can pin on images. And Heather Stamp said, Have a look at uh, what was here by East Riding Archives, East Riding of Yorkshire Council. So that's another one that has. Um, can, I, can I say something about that? Is that all right? Yes, please do, John. I'm John Franklin, I'm from North Yorkshire. Um, I'm sure if somebody from East Riding was already here, they'd be they'd be talking about it. Um, and I hope I'm not st stepping on anybody's toes talking about it. But um, the archivist at East Riding, Sam Bartle, developed an app um, where you can do the um, then and now um, things with the photographs. Well, I think we might have lost your sound, John. So um, it's um, based on and um, what you do, is, and um, it then reveals what it looked like um, using using the photographs from your archive collection. So although they're they it's their app, they are letting other groups and other library authorities and archives um, join in on it. And in fact, we're in negotiations with them about being able to upload our own con our, con our own content on there. So there's already an existing platform. Um, for this sort of thing um, that's being in development and has, 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 has proved um, successful, certainly in East Riding. Um, and I think um, if anybody's interested in that, they, they should ought, ought to contact um, Sam Bartle at East Riding. Um, we've had, we've worked really, we've got a really good relationship with them, um, even though we're, we're, we're working across different authorities. Great. Thanks, John. That sounds brilliant. Um, and there's a couple more examples in the in the chat. So uh, Tom shared a link to the uh, Google Google Maps platform he's set up for South End, which looks like really great um, uh, sort of readily available free technology that Tom's used in a really creative way. Um, Clover is saying that they were involved. They had a story trails in Blackpool, and I, I saw some of the stuff that was created there, and it was was fabulous. So that's great that you've got some VR headsets and iPads now so that you can continue to use all that amazing material. Um, Solihull's also been experimenting with VR, uh, thanks to a National Archives testbed grant, so that's great. Um, so it, it sounds like there's a lot starting to happen um, around use of uh, all this technology that of course is really familiar to people to try and bring those, those stories out. So maybe it sounds like that'd be a good subject for a future a follow-on webinar to share some more examples and a bit more how-to um, and look at ways you can do it with a massive budget or with with very little very little extra funding at all i think we've got time for one really quick question about history trails so again interest in that um how to set up a history trail and also how to evaluate its impact use and impact what it means to people so i don't know if any of the speakers have got examples of doing that and can point to any useful resources I have again. I've done one, but I, I'm not very good on the resources bit because it's always in partnership. So I went with Living Archives in Milton Keynes um, on a previous project um, called MK Skate. It was about the heritage of skateboarding in Milton Keynes, and uh, we did this fabulous walking tour with skateboarders. And they took us through all the key spots, and we collected oral histories, and we collected photographs, and um, we had an archive through the. Um, previous photographers, photographers who have been taking photos in Milton Keynes through the years. And uh, it's on an app, so you can get the Living Archive app and just have a look at that. So I don't know anything about the tech, I'm afraid, but it, it it's a very nice thing. They have lots of other things on there, and I don't know how they evaluate it. I'm suspecting it's down, numbers of downloads, um, but not much more. Great, but obviously it's more tricky if you set up um, a history trail that isn't relying on an app. Um, it's a bit more tricky to, to monitor unless you do um, some kind of sample spot monitoring on particular days and try and capture people. So one of those those um, challenges. Um, I'm really sad to say we could keep this running all afternoon because there are more questions that were in there um, and really great points added to the to the. But we've run out of time now. It's gone so quick. Um, so. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much to our fabulous speakers for today. You've certainly 
um, inspired and provoked and made us think about lots of things and a lot more, lot more to come. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. And also thank you to everyone who came along today and for all the brilliant stuff that you've put in the thread. We will um, publish this on our YouTube channel when we've done the editing, the wizzy bit with the tech. So we'll send out a link to it once that's published. We'll also make sure we've captured all the useful links that are in there for just some of the resources and things that you can look at and we'll share those as well with everybody. But thank you very much. And do, do email us at info at libraries UK. Please do email us if you if you've got suggestions on how we could um, a, a do um, more webinars on, on this theme to continue looking at how libraries, heritage and archives can work together. So thanks very much. Hope you all have a lovely rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.